site of COVID-19 support for business owners and operators that includes government support, PPE startup grants, a professional service fund, and microloans proudly supported by founder, by founding funder Newmont Porcupine, matched by the Venture Center and MNP LLP, and administered by the Chamber. For more information, please visit the Chamber's website. On behalf of the board and staff, I'd like to thank you for joining us today with the presentation of, with the Porcupine Health Unit on how we can best prepare our workplaces with proper PPE guidelines. Throughout this pandemic, and as the economy slowly begins to reopen, we've heard the business community has questions as it pertains to protecting their staff and clients, and how best they can implement physical distancing measures. As a result of your ask, the Chamber has reached out to the Porcupine Health Unit to prepare this live presentation so that you can ask your questions to the Porcupine Health Unit directly. With that, I'd like to pass it off to Dr. Leanne Kat to provide some opening remarks. Dr. Kat, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for inviting us and, in, and including us in your discussions. I think um, we recognize how vitally important not only is the business community to our community on a regular basis um, and, and during normal times, but especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we really recognize the important role that all of our businesses will play going forward to ensure that appropriate infection prevention measures are in place to reduce the spread of COVID-19 uh, within our community. At this time, I'll just give a really quick up general update and then, uh, and, and, and then we can carry on. So uh, we do continue to report the good news of no new cases. However, I think it's really critical at this point in time to ensure that we're all really clear that we're not out of the woods yet, that it is still too early to, to really celebrate while we enjoy that, that news on a regular basis and any day that we're not announcing new cases or not announcing tragic outcomes is always a good day. It's really too early to celebrate. And so while we appreciate and thank community members for their ongoing commitment to the infection prevention measures and the public health measures that have got us here, we again continue to emphasize the need for ongoing precautions in place and for ongoing commitment uh, to ensuring that we're all taking the steps necessary both within our personal lives and within our professional lives uh, to protect uh, all community members and prevent the spread of COVID-19. And so we're happy to, to be involved today and to be um, working with the Chamber and all local businesses to ensure that we're able to, to better support and work with all of you uh, to ensure the measures are in place for the best infection prevention uh, precautions for both all of your staff, employees, and any clients that will be that will be visiting any of your places in the weeks and months to come as we hope we see things. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to move over to the to the question portion of our of our uh, Zoom. And first, I'd like to open it up to uh, to all the participants if there's any questions out there that they have. If not, I have some questions here as well. Anybody? Okay. Val, if you wouldn't mind, I know that uh, it may be a good idea if Dr. Catton uh, and her team would like to perhaps first do a demonstration. Oh, sure. Them, and then that way I can spotlight their video for everybody to see. Okay. Marty, you're up. <laughs> and before we, can I, can I hijack the demonstration for one quick moment? <laughs> I know there's a lot of interest on, on the, the PPE use and, and I definitely recognize the need to ensure that any uh, non-surgical, non-medical masks are being used by the public, by any business, by any workplace in a safe manner uh, and definitely encourage that and very pleased that we're able to, to provide some of that information and direction today. I think it's also critical to recognize the other steps that I know uh, local workplaces and businesses have been undertaking uh, and the other recommendations that are really critical to ensure infection prevention uh, in staff and in workplaces. And so I know we'll likely get into that shortly, but I think we need to recognize that the use of any type of PPE does not negate 
the need for strict hand washing, for ensuring physical distancing, and for ensuring that anyone who's unwell remains at home at all times, and to really support that from a workplace perspective for your staff, and to also encourage that and, and accept that as being our new norm going forward for community members as well. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> so, first step, obviously, wash your hands. Uh, the method is to rub your hands. Make sure that you get the back of your hands. You get your fingernails by rubbing it through the, the palm of your hand. Change both sides. Get your thumb. And also your wrists. And now your hands are clean. All right. So it takes approximately 15 to 20 seconds to do so. All right. Now we're going to put on the mask. So the mask, uh, are, we, are they going to be using masks like this? Probably not. Eh? Well, surgical and medical masks are to be reversed, reserved for healthcare providers so that yeah. we ensure we have the capacity within the healthcare system to respond to those that are ill. Uh, as the hope is, is that individuals who are having symptoms should not be out in public uh, or at work. And so generally, these will likely be non surgical or cloth, homemade masks, or other type of face covering. That's correct. So if you do so, just make sure you put it over your nose. Wrap it around your ears and tug the bottom so that it's secured under your chin. Uh, this particular one at the middle lip that I secure on my nose. And then I proceed to the gloves. It'll be simple. One, two, and we're done. Now to remove these, uh, you grab a good chunk of the, the glove at your palm and you pull out. So this hand is still has not been touched. You can crumble the glove in your hand and then you go under the glove, combine both, and you can put it in the garbage. At this point, your hands may be contaminated so we wash your hands again. Same measures that we talked about. Get everywhere, fingers, palm, fingernails, thumb, wrist, so on. And then to remove the mask, you grab the ear loops, you remove it. Uh, it's a cloth mask. You probably wanted to wash it. Uh, and you can discard it. Uh, if you at any point in time you touch your face, wash your hands. <laughs> Anything else to add, Dr. Ken? I think the key thing when we look at any individuals using masks, whether it's in a healthcare setting or the general public or any other workplace, the main risks in using a mask that we want to ensure people are aware of and are monitoring for and conscious of is to not be touching and adjusting your face with a mask on it with dirty hands. And so really the, the, the risks are um, resisting the urge to adjust and touch things after you've already gone through the process of putting it on with clean hands. Similarly, we often see, and we've seen this in the news recently, people taking their masks and putting them underneath their chin. Uh, again, something else that is definitely not recommended. You need to assume that the outside of the mask is now um, potentially contaminated or dirty and it's not something you want to be touching. And likewise, it doesn't do you any good or anyone any good under the chin um, and is potentially um, causing other, other routes of infection. So those are the main risks. Um, with, with using the mask. And so just really ensuring strict hand washing protocols, taking it off where you're not touching your face in any way, ensuring that the disposal is done. When we look at workplace, when we look at the guidance document, sort of um, a touchless lined garbage facility to be able to, to put it in is preferred. And then again, if you're washing it, there's, uh, there's instructions on uh, homemade cloth masks and how to wash those and make sure that that's done safely.
Well, thank you for that. That was very uh, informative. Um, moving forward, I guess, to the question part now, Cameron. What kind of signage would a, would a typical business need in dealing with, in dealing with the pandemic? Thank you. That's a very good question. And we have provided uh, some examples and can continue to provide examples. There's several signs that uh, we hope um, every workplace is, is looking to, to provide. And some of the recommendations include, uh, a, number one, a question or a um, sign that flags anyone who may have any symptoms re relative to COVID-19 and sort of a stop and answer, a way to screen people at the door, um, that if they have fever, cough, shortness of breath, that it flags to them that, you know, unfortunately, if you have these symptoms, we really don't, you can't be coming into our premise at this point in time. And we need to explore other options where we may be able to support you. The other uh, types of signage include hand washing stations where people can wash their hands, um, where there is availability and promotion of hand washing, especially for, so that would include not only promoting hand washing for those entering a premise and clientele that might be coming in, but also ensuring that we have signage within the facility to promote hand washing of staff. So around break rooms, around washrooms, we know break time is another um, considerable opportunity for people to, to spread infection. Um, you know, we tend to really focus on physical distancing during work hours within the workplace. Um, but during break time, sometimes that can be an opportunity where people may remove their masks, where people may let their guard down and visit in closer proximity. So the, the third sign is around the physical distancing. And so ensuring that we are promoting, again, for both staff and clients or, or patients or whomever may be entering the, the workplace or the business um, to make sure that they're all recognizing two meters apart. And so often we see um, tape on the floor. We sometimes see tape outside measuring the two meters apart so that we're limiting the numbers coming into a premise at one point in time so that we are able to provide that two meters of physical distancing. Thank you. Um, I see we have a question here from uh, Dr. Briand. No. Oh, yes, I had a couple of questions. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, one was, will the health unit create a video on how to apply this PPE? Because I, my staff is going to have to wear PPE um, as per the government regulations. And so it would be really nice if I could show them a video of like, here's how you do it properly. Uh, and then part two to my question is um, it, the regulations from the College of Optometrists has to do with, obviously we have to wear surgical masks um, and if we touch the patient, we have to wear gloves. Um, for my staff, I, the, the plan is to equip them all with surgical masks because one, we can't physically distance our cell, ourselves from each other. And two, most of the work that we do involves being in close contact. Um, they're going to be wearing surgical masks and the face shield. But in this situation where it's staff and they're like the time that they have to get closer to the patient is during like measurement of glasses. Like, could they wear a reusable mask instead of a surgical mask? I think we can we can have further discussions around this because I do expect that we'll see some more specific guidance documents coming from the ministry that may be further amended. So for the first question, we definitely we have already done a video um, that's just sort of in its final editing processes <laughs> uh, in order to to further uh, demonstrate proper PPE donning and doffing and Public Health Ontario also has similar videos so we will definitely be sharing that very soon. Um, the second question around the actual PPE, you're right, um, in your workplace you're not going to be able to maintain that, that physical distancing um, and with the time that's sometimes spent with clients you're definitely going to be sort of in that proximity for potentially a longer time frame and so you do need the surgical masks, um, you do need the face shield or the goggles or glasses, uh, the medical ones. Um, as far as having non-surgical grade masks otherwise, I, I'm not sure that there's specific language or guidance around this, but I would probably recommend that within the workplace to, because you're otherwise using the surgical grade, that you would maintain the surgical grade um, throughout the, the entire shift. And there is some guidance that I think we'll be able to look to um, 
A, we make it sound very specific for, for optometry settings, but if not, I think there is some guidance that we can look at from other workplaces uh, that are somewhat similar, somewhat not, but where you're looking at not having that physical distancing. That can help guide how many surgical masks this may be throughout a day or how that might look. So can they put their surgical mask on? Ideally, they put their surgical mask on and they don't take it off until they get to the end of the or shift or lunch. So if they take it off for lunch and put it aside in a clean space, like a container or something, can they put that same mask back on for the afternoon shift? I know there has been some... Um workplaces, other health care facilities uh, that, that are not doing sort of acute care for COVID patients or symptomatic yeah. patients like you would be, yeah. um, that they do look at arrangements like that. But again, I think we can have some more specific conversations around that and how we might look to do that safely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, a question is pertaining to, to, to the automotive business, which I'm, I'm part of, is part of our process is when, when, we're, when we're letting a customer on a test drive, we sanitize the vehicle, we sanitize it when we come back, we have gloves on. Are the gloves necessary? Or would be washing our hands and using sanitizer be enough? I think uh, it's a very good question, thank you, because we do see a lot of glove usage and it's not that we're telling people not to, but, but it's definitely not necessary in the, in the majority of cases. And to be honest, um, I think there's some concern that perhaps sometimes glove use may then mean that we're not actually washing the gloves. And so we may be looking at increased risk of transmission and infection and spreading in spreading bugs rather than not. And so I think strict hand washing and ensuring that we are having uh, appropriate hand washing and sanitization before and after as you've designated is actually probably um, the best bet. And again, I think really reinforcing what that hand washing looks like. Um, because we know that oftentimes at, at times like this, when we're really looking at preventing infection, um, what people sometimes consider their regular hand washing routine may not be sufficient. And so I think enforcing that message is probably the best bet and we can definitely help support that further. So that would be the case of um, uh, almost using too much PPE and it gives you a, a false sense of security so you're not doing the proper measures. Exactly, okay. exactly, okay. yes. Well, thank you for that. You're Actually, um, Dr. Catton, if you wouldn't mind, and Val, I'm sorry, if, if you could expand on that. It, it, that's, I, I think it, that goes beyond industry specific as well. I know even in food handling, uh, oftentimes uh, the use of gloves is discouraged because it does give you that false sense. Uh, so is it is it sort of just general best, best practice? You know, the mask is a certainly good idea, but just to get into the habit of consistently washing your hands. Yes, exactly. I think the, the hand washing cannot be emphasized enough at this point in time. Um, we really, as things open up, uh, the, the main things that are really going to protect absolutely everyone that are definitely evidence-based that have been shown time and time again with not only COVID, but multiple other infectious diseases that we've seen outbreaks of or pandemics of is hand washing, appropriate hand washing for 20 seconds with approved sanitizers or soap and water where the soap is getting nice and sudsy and actually, you know, not being rinsed off immediately. Um, we have lots of videos and, and, and uh, information that we can help share and support that. I think that is absolutely critical and, and our number one uh, step really that we need to ensure everyone's aware of how to do it well, how often to do it, and to do exactly that sort of not depend on other things um, that may lead to a false sense of security and then not taking the precautions that are, that are really needed. And so um, I think the hand washing is absolutely critical and, and foremost, especially to, to club people. And then if I just could expand on that last point, because I know that a lot of us are likely getting very dry hands at this point, <laughs> would be washing your hands and then applying uh, any type of hand moisturizer, uh, you know, increase the, you know, ability for those types of microbes to stick, or should we just, you know, 
live with it, and then when we get home at the end of the day, apply some proper hand moisturizer. I don't think there's I don't think there's a problem with using any type of, of hand moisturizer that people see appropriate or fit. I think the two comments I would give is if you have open and cracked skin, that's always a site for potential infection, not necessarily COVID, but any infection that we see, you know, that can develop on the skin. And so it is always nice to make sure you you don't have uh, cuts as much as possible. Um, and how the only other thing would be to make sure that the hand sanitizer or that the hand cream you're using um, has also been washed on the outside so that you are only applying it when you've just washed your hands and you're not washing your hands and then using a, a dirty um, or potentially contaminated you know hand cream that you've left somewhere and you tend to use when when you haven't just washed your hands so I think that would be the only added precaution I would recommend that's that's a really good point um, on the next one, how can my business best provide PPE to customers and then dispose of them appropriately? That's a challenging one. And I think uh, first off, what I'll say is we are seeing, uh, we know we've seen across the board um, promotion of non-medical masks or face coverings. So people can likewise use a scarf as well uh, in order to cover. And really what we're looking at when we look at the use of masks in the general population and we're out and about, um, when we're unable to, to ensure that we've got that two meter of physical distancing, we're really looking at source control. So we're looking at the potential for the individual who's wearing the mask to protect others from their potential secretion. So you spread uh, COVID by coughing, sneezing, touching mucous membranes, and then you know sharing it elsewhere. And so the purpose of wearing a mask when you do it properly, uh, as we've already demonstrated, is that that individual then is not potentially spreading um, any anything that they may be incubating or already have and not be aware of. So we're working to try and, and determine opportunities to ensure that anyone in the community who wants a non-medical mask will have access to that. How that looks exactly, we, we don't quite know yet, but we're working with some some partners and sort of exploring some options. We know there's a lot of volunteers and a lot of people who've already been making masks. There's a lot of people who have the means to buy or purchase online or from others. We also know there's a lot of people that probably don't have that type of capability. And so we're really looking at how we can support that uh, further going forward. Again, though, people can use um, a bandana or a scarf or sort of other type of material to, to cover their face if they have nothing and they want to, to um, help with that. When it comes to uh, providing this as a workplace, there, there's a few things that I think we would, we would need some further discussions around. So some of it, again, I think we would probably be looking at for general businesses, you would only be looking at masking as well, since we've talked about sort of the gloves. The, the biggest thing is when people come in the door, making sure that they don't have symptoms, because if they have symptoms of their, or if they're unwell, the best practice really is to encourage them to go home and either shop online or wait until they better, they feel better and come back at that point in time. So that's number one. Number two is having an opportunity for everyone who's coming in the premise to wash their hands. So whether it's a hand washing station, um, they have something that they're able to wash their hands appropriately before they come in is, is the next thing. Um, if you're looking at other types of PPE, I'm assuming you're meaning masks maybe for, for the public, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Um, the challenge around, around providing masks for the public is going to be having uh, an opportunity to make sure that they similarly are washing their hands appropriately, and then how are they obtaining the masks? So we don't want masks all sitting in a box where everyone is now reaching in and grabbing out of this box, even though we're encouraging the hand sanitizing first, I still don't want everybody coming into the store grabbing out of the box, even though they've just used the hand sanitizer. So we know it's still not always always perfect, um, or people may not get all spots. And, and so I think that part of it um, is ensuring that people can get it without potentially contaminating others. Um, and so that's one of the, the considerations in that that needs to sort of be worked out. You know, there's a possibility, can you have staff that are physically distanced appropriately that are wearing their mask, that have clean hands, that are able to hand it and tell people how to put it on. Um, when it comes to taking the masks off uh, in the premise, it would be ideal to have a garbage that is non-contactless. Um, 
no top on it that they need to swing open or move in any way. Um, and then likewise, sort of, I think we would promote if that's something that people are doing, maybe look at what signage, I think we have some here. Uh, there's some signs that are available that, that can help demonstrate uh, to the general public who maybe haven't watched our video or, you know, when you haven't had staff training like you're all um, going to go through so that they know how to take it off and not increase risk. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from uh, Dr. Brienne. So my question was relating to um, the uh, spray hand sanitizer because there's like finding gel hand sanitizer is like impossible, but yet every single company is making liquid spray hand sanitizer. Is that acceptable? I think as long as there's 60% alcohol. I have to check on that. We'll confirm that with you, but it depends on the alcohol content itself. But we will confirm that percentage and, and relay that back to you. But I believe, I believe it. I don't uh, so my, my guidelines are actually 70%. I can okay. only use any products with 70%. And so I, I have found some and I have some. It's just that, you know, when you spray, it, it's different than applying a liquid, right? It's harder, yeah. You, like spray multiple times several surface of your hands but I mean it's better than having absolutely nothing so okay perfect thank you it's true yeah it is going to be harder to get that coverage but as long as you have that percentage then you should be okay okay thank you appreciate it head in I I can get the gel uh, hand sanitizer by Dr. Renault they are manufacturing it in Montreal and um, they we should be getting ours uh, very soon and you can order them uh, individually like the one liter bottles and um, they're designed uh, it's 70% it's because we, that's what we have no choice but to use that as well and um, it, it is uh, strictly uh, very very good for the hands they've put some also some vitamin E and all that product so I'll give you their prices and uh, and see if I can bring some in to you know to forward to you as well. Perfect, thank you. Welcome. Um, next one would be, can I request that a customer adorn PPE before entry and leave with it on? I think, um, I mean, we've heard Premier Ford talk about businesses having the, the opportunity to uh, ask individuals and clients uh, to wear PPE in their premise, and I think that's that's definitely um, something that's reasonable. I think what we need to recognize, and, and it may be a workplace uh, discussion or a business discussion, is that some individuals may really struggle with, with wearing PPE. So we do know that for some individuals who may be very significantly claustrophobic or potentially have COPD or other underlying breathing uh, chronic conditions, that that may be significantly challenging for them. And likewise, we don't want to ask uh, kids under the age of two to be putting masks on. And so that's definitely something else um, that, that we don't want to see. Um, I think otherwise that that could be something that, that could be considered. But again, um, Similarly, it would be nice if there was a garbage disposal uh, for individuals to put their masks because we wouldn't necessarily, um, if, if you're asking them to put it on in the workplace and now they're leaving, then it would be nice if this is something that they feel is contaminated, that they could take it off, wash their hands and, and leave. So that would just be one consideration that, that might be helpful. Can I uh, ask a question um, about the masks? It's sure, sure. And from Bell Aesthetics, I just wanted to ask, um, we're being asked to have every client wear a mask in our spa. Now, a box of mask now is approximately $50 to $60 a box of 50 masks, where we used to pay $13, like just a few months ago. Um, like, I, and I know that they've, a lot of businesses are going to have to ask the customers to pay a surcharge of you know whatever two dollars to compensate for the masks and all of that but why is there such a hike in prices and i know that there's a lack of shortage of masks but why are we having you know uh to to absorb all these costs um i i know the chamber of commerce did help with some but i mean just my signs alone um and my my plexiglass is like 
almost $600. Like, I mean, and plus your, the mask, the hand sanitizer, everything. And I know we need it at all, but I mean, are the masks prices ever going to go back down again? Like, is it fair to ask all these people to pay for that money? I completely understand your concern and your question. I don't think I'm going to have any satisfying answer for it, unfortunately. Uh, you're right, it is, it is expensive uh, on all fronts right now, and it has been really unfortunate to see a lot of um, the personal protective equipment and sort of costs and access to things that really will help prevent infections for the population and, and see how that um, has been an ongoing challenge. And unfortunately, I can't comment on, on the price of it or, or how and when. I mean, I agree and I hope it would come down uh, that it makes it something that is more accessible and easy for people to use and implement. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have any clear, any clear answer for you. Ori? Um, to answer Lynn, though, I think our college is, has said that we uh, every patient above the age of two has to wear a mask, whether it's disposable or not. And if they do not have one, then we can refuse care. Um, and so, Lynn, I don't think as a business owner that you have to... Um, take on the burden of providing a mask to your patients. I think it's fair game to tell your patients of like, you need to have a mask. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just blocking from them, like spitting all over you and sneezing and stuff like that's the purpose of it. Right. It's just to stop that spray of that's it. aerosol spray. Right. So have them provide their own masks. And if they, if they can't, cause there are lots of people in the community who are making masks. You can make one out of a sock. Like there's so many creative ways that you can make a mask that you should not be paying for them to wear one. If they want to, utilize your service bring one if you don't have one then sorry i'm going to book somebody else yeah because i have one of my signs and it says stop and if you don't have a mask you rather basically they're going to have to buy one from me or else they can't have a service done um unless i'm doing a facial then i will have my shield and my mask you know what i mean but at what point um i don't even know when we're going to be able to do facials when we're going to be allowed to do that part i I don't know, we haven't been told anything yet. So it's a little bit confusing for us. I mean, you know, it, it's scary because we are working right above the person's face, you know, when you're waxing and doing facials. And, but it's, um, yeah, we need to get back to work, but what do we do? Like, I, I don't know. Lynn, if I could interject as well. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Kat, no, please That's go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and I think you raise a good point because, I mean, there is going to be a lot of unique challenges and a lot of unique industry challenges, uh, sector specific, of course, as well. And the good thing is, is that the Porcupine Health Unit's uh, business section is actually really, really well bolstered for a lot of sector specific guidelines. And that's actually dovetailed well into the Chamber's uh, business uh, continuity, recovery, government resources. But so, too, do you have the consistent use of not only the Stop the Spread uh, information COVID line through the uh, province of Ontario, uh, but the Canadian Chamber has also released a small business helpline uh, as well. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to continue these discussions to understand how um, the, our community partners as well as the province can assist in those guidelines. Um, sorry, Dr. Ken. No, that you said it very well, <laughs> probably better than I would have. So that's great. Thank you. I completely agree. And I think um, I know the, the uncertainty is really challenging for everyone right now. And, and I'll just assure you that I don't have any insight um, or special information uh, as to when specific things are going to open or when they won't. Um, and, and likewise, we know that the information with respect to not only the medical aspects of COVID-19 is constantly evolving, but so are the public health measures, so is the testing measures, so will the business measures and, and how we look to open the province. And so I think while it is exceedingly challenging to deal with the uncertainty and sort of try and, and just determine where we're going to go and when, um, I just want to assure you but as we learn developments, we will share them with you. We, we look forward to continued engagement with, with each of you and, and different sectors and individual circumstances, and we will continue to support uh, all of the workplaces and businesses in the community to make sure that we're able to sort of, you know, go through these evolving waters together and make sure that we're protecting everyone to the best of the abilities uh, as we go forward. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question here from, can I require my employees to purchase their own 
personal protective equipment or should I provide it? <laughs> that might be more of a Ministry of Labor question <laughs> than a Dr. Catton question. <laughs> um, I, think, I think when we look at how we can support employees, that one, that one I will probably leave to the end for now. But I, the one thing I would really encourage uh, when we look at, at supporting employees in the workplace, um, you can ask, but I'm going to use this as my segue, I hope that's okay, uh, would be really ensuring that we have policies and procedures and a supportive environment for employees to stay home when they're feeling unwell in any way. And so I think, you know, we see, we know that people are struggling emotionally, we know people are struggling mentally, we know people are, are struggling financially throughout this, throughout this pandemic, and we know people want to get back to work and they want to be productive and they want to contribute to society and their workplace and the community. And I think it's just really making sure that we're really, really supportive uh, for anyone who might have even mild symptoms, because we know it's often a very, very mild infection. People would not normally consider calling in sick or not doing their daily activities uh, with some of the, the symptoms that we are seeing in some of our cases. And so I think it's just really making sure that we're having that ongoing conversation uh, to support people to stay home, because that's really, really critical uh, going forward. Uh, as we open up more places, we need people to stay home if they're unwell, get tested, so that we can do the appropriate contact tracing and follow up and really limit that spread. Okay, thank you. Uh, on, uh, for our business, I've got, because you, you deferred previously that when customers walk into a business, they should wash their hands. Mm -hmm. in, in, our, in our business, Quite a distance between walking into the into the, the establishment and the washrooms, is having a just a hand sanitizer there sufficient? Definitely, definitely sufficient. Yes, for sure. And that's where you could put the signage and have the hand sanitizer right. and then promote all that at the same at the same location. That's ideal. Any other questions? Well, I, I wouldn't mind asking a question. And I mean, I know that uh, this is this is separate from the, the PPE aspect of, of what we're doing, but I know that, you know, the Premier is pushing for uh, getting as, as much testing done as possible. And I'm not nearly, you know, clearly we're sensitive to the to the notion that likely many test labs are over capacity and, and are dealing with the results as best as they can. Um, if you were to give a piece of advice to whether it be an employer, employee, uh, and you know we recognize that that test is a snapshot in time, uh, is there any value in going to get that test uh, to discover whether or not you're asymptomatic, uh, potentially if you carry uh, some form of antibody? You know, is is there a cry that you'd like to put out to the business community to say this is why you should do it? Very good question, thank you, <laughs> and, and very very uh, very well put. So I think. I think definitely we do want to see more testing. Um, I can, number one, I can assure everyone that the Porcupine Health Unit region has continued to have testing rates above the provincial rates and even above Canadian rates for some time now. And so we are quite pleased with that. However, we have noticed a decrease in the number of calls uh, to the health unit and to primary care providers for referral to assessment centers in over the last couple of weeks. And I've been really working with healthcare partners and sort of changing our messaging to be a little bit more direct to try and get people who had symptoms, because that, that was the guidance at that point in time, to present for testing. I think when it comes to workplaces and that potential role, um, I think we'll probably have a little bit more, uh, more recommendations and guidance going forward around strategic surveillance uh, initiatives and looking at, you know, are there certain populations that we really need to increase testing and are there certain uh, workplaces, certain demographics that we really want to see increased testing and that would be more of a, a strategic surveillance that, that we would definitely inform and, and probably look to the business to community to help support um, as we go forward to really inform not only where we're at now, where maybe we have been with COVID-19, but also really to, to further inform the next steps when we look at a second wave um, and when we look at things changing and evolving. I think when it comes to testing, the main thing right now is making sure that everyone who has symptoms, and again, they could be exceedingly mild and even just one, even something like a change in taste or a change in smell can actually herald the COVID-19 uh, infection. And so I think 
the, the main plea to, to businesses and workplaces is to make sure that we're really, again, supportive of individuals to stay home when they have symptoms, but also that they get tested if they have symptoms, because really we need to ensure that we are testing everyone that has symptoms so we know what our disease burden is and that we're able to make sure that those that are symptomatic and that are positive, that we're able to reach all of their contacts, that we're able to follow up and ensure anyone that may have been exposed is getting tested and is likewise isolating and then not exposing others. So I think those are the main things. And then for anyone, and you already said it, but I'm going to say it again because I think it's exceedingly important, um, that for anyone who does wish to have test, a testing done, even though they have no symptoms, as we've heard, everyone will have access to that. At this point in time, the Timmins Assessment Centre is still operating on an appointment basis. Um, but anyone who wishes uh, to, to have a test because they're concerned they may have been exposed, they're concerned they may be at greater risk, or, uh, or sort of definitely if they have symptoms, to please call again through the Porcupine Health Unit or their primary care provider. Um, the teams will go through the, the questions around the symptoms again, and that's only so we get an idea of the potential risks of individuals who are getting tested, so we know who we may need to follow up with more closely uh, with respect to the results, and so we can keep track and monitor uh, the testing that's being done. So again, everyone will be tested um, if, they, if they seek testing. And I think if people are getting tested, the only, the other piece that you already said that is so important is that it is simply a snapshot in time. And so whether people are symptomatic or asymptomatic, if they get testing, the test result is good on the day that they had the test done when it's negative. And so it is, while it is reassuring for people um, and it may be reassuring for workplaces to know that people have tested negative, if they tested negative on Sunday, as of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, any day after that, they could still be potentially incubating illness. They could become infectious. They could develop COVID. And so the, while I, I, that's not a reason to discourage testing, it is only a reason to, it, to ensure that people understand what a negative test means. And that while it may be reassuring and, and that's encouraging and great news, that it still means we need to continue with the infection prevention measures. Um, they remain absolutely critical. And then also, if they were to develop any type of symptoms, to get retested right away. And I think um, you raise a good point too, because it kind of removes like a little bit of the, the the worry and you know, well, boy, when I call, what am I going in? What am I walking into? What what's what am I going to be met with when I come to the testing facility? Is is there a specific location? Is it at the PHU? Is there a queue? You know. Right, so do you want me to answer some of that too at this point? Please, if you wouldn't mind, even just Sure, so, so the, the Timmins Assessment Center is located at um, the Intrepid Place in the CMHA Library Building. It is not in the library and it is not in, in it is in its own enclosed space. Um, and so the, the reason why we've continued with the appointment uh, standard and again, the it is not so that anyone will be refused testing or, or told that they're not able to go for testing, but it is in order to ensure that we have patient information, not we, it's, it's really run by the primary care team here in town, uh, the Timmins Academic Family Health Team and the Timmins and District Hospital as well as Cochrane District EMS have really taken a significant role. We've all been collaborating and they've really taken on a tremendous leadership in ensuring that the community has access to testing. And so I do need to thank them and recognize that first and foremost. Um, so what happens is that uh, individuals are referred either from the Porcupine Health Unit or from the primary care provider through the Timmins Academic Family Health Team who then book in clients for testing. The reason uh, for booking is to not only ensure that we have the appropriate patient chart and information for the individuals and the healthcare providers that are doing the testing on the day that you show up, so that's all ready and you don't need to, to go through paperwork when you arrive, but also to ensure that we're able to space out appointments so that there isn't a lineup or there isn't a lot of people waiting around and lingering and potentially exposing one another. Um, it is people are instructed and I again really need to reinforce and encourage people to use the, it's the Brunei Street entrance, right? The Brunei Street entrance for the assessment center because that is where it is. So please do not go through uh, 
the other main entrance to the building, but use the Brunei entrance. And what happens is there's someone there to greet patients, uh, to let them know to wash their hands. They're given a mask and advised how to put it on. And then once uh, the other individuals have already gone through the process, you will go in and, and be greeted to confirm your, your health card information, um, just sort of verbally make, I believe, I haven't gone through the process myself, I must say, but we've worked through it with the team there and the, and the partners involved. And then you'll be seen by a health care provider who will um, have all the appropriate PPE uh, on and be following all the in appropriate infection prevention uh, and control measures and then they will conduct the test which at this point is a nasal swab so it's like a long q-tip that goes into the nose and just one swab will be done and then individuals um, leave through a separate entrance and so people come in one entrance and leave out the other at the other entrance and the assessment center is open at this point, seven days a week. Um, and again, the referrals through the health unit and we're open seven days a week as well to take home. And I know you had mentioned that the, you, know, you can do a testing. Today they've, they've tested uh, negative, but tomorrow they may test positive because you know, they may have come in contact with it. Or, uh, but the test itself, is it 100% accurate or is there a fail rate on that as well? Uh, the testing actually right now is has been fairly accurate. Um, when when we have a positive, we generally we know that this is a positive test. Um, there's been very little um, discussion or concern around false negatives. The Public Health Ontario labs, when they initially started the lab testing within Ontario, everything was. Uh, done locally and sent to the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, and so there's been many, many, many uh, iterations and. Um, I'm forgetting the appropriate word, but processes and checks and balances to make sure the accuracy of the testing. And so different labs use slightly different assays, um, but at this point in time, uh, it, it is a very good test. The one thing I will say, you mentioned it earlier actually, and I never, I, I didn't acknowledge it and I apologize. I think it was in the middle of another question and I tend to ramble and get off course, uh, was around antibody testing. And so this test right now, the nasal test, is a test that's more looking for an acute infection. It uh, is a a uh, PCR test, a polymerized chain reaction, and it picks up RNA strands. So it picks up some genotypes of, of the infectious material, basically. Um, but when we look at serology or blood testing, that's when we're looking at potentially um, being able to determine whether or not someone's been exposed in the past, whether or not there may be some antibody development. And that has just recently been approved by Health Canada and is still uh, undergoing, again, further, further tests and, and analyses by the, the Ministry of Health in Ontario and Public Health Ontario to determine what that test may be able to tell us, what its limitations might be, and then how we might be able to use it going forward. So there'll be more about that in the weeks to come as well. And how, what, how long did it take to get the results from the tests? Um, at this point in time, I think we're looking at a turnaround of about two to four days. We have seen some come back much quicker. Uh, the one challenge in the north often is transportation and so we are working with uh, ministry and, and public health Ontario lab officials and other partners to try and, and sort out other options to, uh, to further facilitate that but it's generally pretty good. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, then I just want to take this uh, opportunity to thank you, Dr. Catton, and your team there for, for taking a leadership role in this and for everything that you've done uh, uh, in regards to the pandemic. Uh, we know that we'll continue to communicate so that our members have the most relevant and up-to-date information for our business community. I'd like to encourage everybody to reach out to the Chamber should you need support to help you with your business through this time. For more information, go to timmonschamber.on.ca forward slash support to learn more about how your business can benefit. We are actively updating our social platforms to ensure that the information you receive is both accurate and up to date. And you can join us tomorrow for our second summer student virtual job fair beginning at 10 a.m. If you're, you're able to register through the Chamber's Facebook page, and thank you again, Dr. Catton and your team. And be safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.